All right, well, I am going to go ahead and kick us off. Uh, hey, everybody, thank you so much for joining us tonight for the Art of Birding from Earth Day to Migratory Bird Day. Uh, we have a great lineup plan to celebrate these two conservation holidays. We're going to talk about what it means to be an artist working in conservation, the importance of protecting migratory birds, and how the Desert National Wildlife Refuge and Arctic National Wildlife Refuge have more in common than some might think. Before we get started, I do want to respectfully acknowledge that the lands we're talking from and about tonight are the traditional lands of the Nuwubi, Gwich'in, Inupiat, and Tanana people who have stewarded these lands throughout the generations. I pay my respect to elders past, present, and future and I invite you all to please take a moment to consider the many legacies and histories that bring us together here today. All right, I am Grace Palermo and I will be our moderator tonight. I use she, her pronouns and am the Southern Nevada Programs Director at Friends of Nevada Wilderness. Uh, Friends has been a huge champion of wild places like the Desert National Wildlife Refuge since the 1970s. And we've been one of the leaders in the fight to save the refuge from military expansion through our Don't Bomb the Bighorn campaign. And I'm excited to share that because of that work to permanently protect the desert refuge, the National Wildlife Refuge Association recently announced that the Friends of Nevada Wilderness Executive Director Sharon Netherton and former Southern Nevada Director Jose Witt have received their coveted Advocate of the Year Award. Sharon and Jose are receiving this award for their leadership in creating and leading a coalition of organizations opposed to further expansion of the Nellis Test and Training Range into the refuge. And they were nominated for the award by Refuge Complex Manager Kevin Des Roberts. And of course, the progress we've made fighting military expansion into the Desert Refuge would not have happened without the support of many organizations, indigenous community leaders, and um, elected officials and all the individuals who showed up at meetings, wrote letters and signed petitions. So I wanna give a big shout out and say thank you to all of you. And I also want to thank our co-hosts for this event, friends of the Alaska National Wildlife Refuges and the US Fish and Wildlife Service. And thank you all for joining us. Um, so with that, we We'll go ahead and get into it. We have two wonderful speakers tonight that I want to introduce you to. The first is Sarah Woolman, who is an award-winning classic and graphic artist. Her art reflects the relationship she has established with the environment and serves as a reminder of the inherent connection we all have with the natural world. She strives for her art to be used primarily for education and engagement and to allow audiences to form their own relationships with nature. Originally from New York, she now calls Fairbanks, Alaska home. Her work can be found at national wildlife refuges and national park sites across the country. She has created artwork for conservation-based nonprofits such as the National Parks Conserva Conservation Association, Explore.org, and the Katmai Conservancy, as well as campaigns such as Fat Bear Week and Arctic Bird Fest. She currently works for Arctic National Wildlife Refuge as a visual information specialist. And when she is not working on conservation-related art, she is often found rafting rivers, climbing mountains, and gaining inspiration from the beautiful, beautiful world we live in. Um, so thank you, Sarah. Really glad you're here joining us tonight. Glad to be uh, here. All right, and our second presenter here with us tonight is Josh Contois, who has been the park ranger for the Desert National Wildlife Com Refuge Complex since early 2019. And prior to joining the Fish and Wildlife Service, Josh worked for the Smithsonian Institution, National Park Service, and U.S. Forest Service. He has two degrees, a BA in American History and an MS in Parks and Resource Management. Josh has always been fascinated with the wild places of American West and continually explores new places to get off the beaten path and onto the trail less traveled. He started doing landscape photography to document his adventures and it spawned a social media following. His photos have been featured by Backpacker Magazine, The Outbound Collective, and Juniper Ridge. And in his spare time, Josh is an avid hiker, photographer, and craft beer enthusiast. 
And so with that, I will pass it off to Josh and Sarah. Thank you. And thank you everyone for being here today. Um, first and foremost, I'd like to just acknowledge today is Earth Day and thank you for celebrating Earth Day with us. Um, I'd like to start by sharing this very famous picture here. This is uh, taken by the Voyager 1 spacecraft in 1990. It's called the Pale Blue Dot. Um, just kind of to put things into perspective. Um, without trying to, to say too much, I'd like to quote Carl Sagan who said it best. And he said, look at that dot. That's here. That's home. That's us. On it, everyone you love, everyone you know, everyone you ever heard of, every human being who ever was lived out their lives. The aggregate of our joy and suffering, thousands of confident religions, ideologies, and economic doctrines, every hunter and forager, every hero and coward, every creator and destroyer of civilization, every king and peasant, every young couple in love, every mother and father, hopeful child, inventor, and explorer, every teacher of morals, every corrupt politician, every superstar, every supreme leader, every saint and sinner in the history of our species lived there on a moat of dust suspended in the sun. We are here today to talk about our planet and the wonderful creatures that live in it. Uh, and so we're also celebrating today World Migratory Bird Day. Now, if you're wondering what World Migratory Bird Day is, it's an annual awareness raising campaign highlighting the need for conservation of migratory birds and their habitats. It has global outreach and is an effective tool to help raise global awareness uh, to the threats faced by migratory birds, uh, the ecological importance of migratory birds, and the need for international cooperation to conserve them. So it really is a World Migratory Bird Day. So how is it celebrated? Well, every year, people around the world take action and organize public events such as bird festivals, education programs, exhibits, and bird watching excursions to celebrate World Migratory Bird Day. All of these activities can be undertaken at any time of the year because the countries or regions observing the peak migrations uh, all happen at different times. Uh, but the main days uh, are for the celebration are uh, the second Saturday in May and in October. So we will be celebrating Migratory Birthday uh, May 8th this year at the Desert National Wildlife Refuge. But we are celebrating, of course, all spring long with a whole bunch of different events. And we are thrilled today to be uh, chatting with Sarah, uh, who is our official World Migratory Bird Day 2021 artist. And I would like to start our little conversation today with a video uh, that has a little bit more information about the event and about Sarah. And so here we go. of tall buildings and gray infrastructure gave me the ability to appreciate the contrast of the organic colors and shapes that nature provides. The constant in this giant cityscape that gave me a look into a wilder world of inspiration were the birds that made it their home. As years passed, my appreciation for birds and their freedom of expression grew. When I began working for the United States Fish and Wildlife Service in Alaska, I wanted to highlight the connection of birds and art. Birds in Alaska mean so much. We depend on them. They provide us food, company, and our telltale signs of change. We welcome the birds every year with the spring and bid them farewell as the darkness approaches. These are the stories I spoke of when I taught about birds to school children in Bush, Alaska. Birds are a universal language. They connect us. 
People in places tucked away in these sacred corners of the world understand birds in a way that we should all strive for. Every single one of us has a story of our personal experience with birds to share. To be able to channel that onto paper through artistic mediums really gives tangible meaning to that connection. It provides us all a space to celebrate these birds. I currently work for Arctic National Wildlife Refuge as a visual information specialist. I work to bring the beauty of this place to the rest of the world. Birds at Arctic Refuge are so incredibly important. It's home to over 200 bird species who fly here specifically to breed. They come thousands of miles to this special place, bringing with them the connection from every place they touch. They truly have a freedom in flying to the ends of the earth and back every year. Claude Monet once said, I would like to paint the way a bird sings. Now I would like to paint not only how birds sing, but how birds fly and how birds bring us together. I want everyone to stop and look at those birds right outside your window. Think about their journey and what other people have observed that very same bird. That bird represents so much that connects us. Their freedom in flight and their beauty in song are things we have always craned our necks to observe from the dawn of humanity. Join me in celebrating World Migratory Bird Day 2021 to sing, fly, and soar like a bird and experience the true freedom, beauty, and design in these wild creatures that bring us all together. So <clears throat> I'd like to turn it back over to Sarah. Um, it was a wonderful video. And again, thank you for joining us. Sure. Uh, so so um, the, the format for this section is just going to be kind of a, a, a Q&A. Uh, I've got a few questions for you here to kind of let, let the, the audience get to know you a little bit more about what you uh, do and your art and things of that sort. And then please, if you have any questions, do put them in the chat, whether you're watching on Zoom or on Facebook. And uh, Grace will really get those questions to Sarah and we'll get your questions answered live on this broadcast. Um, and so just to, to dive right in, um, Sarah, can tell us a bit more about um, how you got started in art and maybe more about how you developed your style. Sure, um, well, as you saw in the video, I've, I've pretty much been an artist as far back as I can remember, um, but I did, I did attend art school um, in Pennsylvania with a degree in illustration and graphic design. Um, and so I, I did that for a long time. And then actually it's funny cause I uh, switched majors and I also have a degree in political science on top of that. Um, and really my main inspiration has always been nature. Uh, it, it means so much to me. And I really started to kind of hit my, my groove um, when I moved to Alaska because Nature is just such an inherent part of life here. Um, your life is ruled by the seasons and the change here. And that that really kind of um, gave me the, the big push to really start doing a lot more of it. And um, I really love to focus on color. And you'll see in a lot of um, the different pieces that I do, every, especially because I've been um, doing a lot of digital art lately. Uh, I, I really like to use the actual natural color of the bird or whichever animal I'm drawing to just more point out how beautiful nature actually is without me coming in and changing it. Great, thank you. So you mentioned in the video and on our introduction that you are a visual information specialist for the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. Could you tell us a bit more about what a visual information specialist is and what your job entails? Sure, yeah, it seems kind of vague. <laughs> um, but yeah, so a visual information specialist uh, classically usually has to work with uh, different media platforms. So I am constantly monitoring social me our social media presence. Um, I'm designing publications, I'm filming wildlife, I'm putting videos and stuff together, and I'm also creating different graphics and illustrations. Um, a lot of it is science communication. So I am taking whatever we are doing in the field or whichever projects we have going on, and I am putting it in a form that illustrates it to the public. Uh, and it's a really great job, but we need more of them. So <laughs> please, please apply if you're into art. <laughs> yes, please. We all, always use more talented folks working for the agency. Definitely. Uh, so how long have you been at Arctic National Wildlife Refuge? How did you come to, to be in Alaska? Oh, sure. Um, well, I'll start with how did I come to be in Alaska? Because it's kind of a story. <laughs> um, I originally came out here uh, with my uh, my family. We were just on a vacation and I fell in love with it. And 
um, a few years later, I accepted a job in 2013 to come up here and run a youth trail crew um, all over the state. And I kind of just got the bug after that. So after my season was finished, I stayed and I ended up moving uh, to King Salmon, Alaska to work for the Park Service um, at Katmai National Park as a park ranger there. Uh, so if, if you're familiar, if you're not familiar with that, um, it's it's the classic picture of uh, the bear at the falls catching a fish. That's, that's Katmai National Park. Um, so I lived actually out in King Salmon for about seven years or so. And uh, to kind of reiterate, uh, Bush, Alaska is completely off the road system. You can only get there via plane or boat, but a very long boat ride. <laughs> so um, it, was, it was pretty remote, pretty isolated. Uh, and then I, I kind of switched agencies and started working for uh, Alaska Peninsula and Bisharoff uh, Wildlife Refuges down there as an education specialist. And I really got to see so much of the area there and connect with a lot of the people and the villages. And I'm very grateful for my time there. Well, I'm sure we're, we're definitely- Oh, and I guess I need to ask, <laughs> to say the second part of that question, well, how did I get to Arctic Refuge? <laughs> um, yes, I moved up to Fairbanks. Gosh, I guess it's been about a year now. Um, and just to get out of the bush, because I was there for quite a long time, it's very nice to be on the road system and uh, get to the grocery store whenever you want. <laughs> um, but yes, I've been here about a year and it's wonderful. It's a magical place. Um, Alaska in general is just amazing. So <laughs> it's, it's huge and it's beautiful. Great. Um, so, uh, before becoming the 2021 World Migratory Bird Day Artist, what kind of uh, projects have you worked on at Arctic National Wildlife Refuge or uh, in general? I think you mentioned like Fat Bear Week and a couple of things. Yeah, <laughs> I, do, I do a little bit of everything. I dabble. <laughs> so aside from um, my work with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, I am also a freelance um, artist and illustrator. Uh, so I have been for the past couple of years um, contracted by uh, an organization called the Katmai Conservancy, which works uh, with explore.org and Katmai National Park. And they run Fat Bear Week. And if you're not familiar with it, highly recommend Googling that because you will not be disappointed with the fat bears. They're pretty amazing. <laughs> um, and they do have live cams out there. And um, in October of every year, you're able to vote on the fattest bear. And it's gotten quite uh, notorious worldwide <laughs> at this point. So um, that is something that I, I work on yearly. Um, and then Another another big thing I'm working on too is I don't know if you're anyone's familiar with the um, the horse secretariat, but I'm I'm actually going to be illustrating for for them and the family that owned it um, and and do that as well and kind of rebrand their stuff. But as far as fish and wildlife is concerned, I'm currently working on um, we're doing a big rebrand of the Fish and Wildlife Service, and we're really trying to hit as many people as we can. Um, and kind of, you know, make ourselves available and, and just kind of put ourselves back in touch with everyone that uses these refuges and loves our fish and wildlife. So I've been working on creating different animal illustrations for entrance signs, um, which we call our animal ambassadors. And I, I also, and that's, that's for the refuge system as a whole. And then as far as Arctic refuge is concerned, um, I was finishing up uh, Arctic Virtual Bird Fest, which was a lot of fun last year. We had a really great theme, um, which was all old school 80s videos games. So I got to do a lot of pixelated birds, which was a little bit out of the realm of what I normally work in. And I had a great time doing it. <laughs> and I would like to say for the panelists watching too, that uh, Sarah's work has been featured in the, the Recreate Responsibly campaign, which uh, came out of the direct response to the COVID-19 pandemic. And she has created a whole slew of artwork for new signs and banners, just reminding folks to be safe and be smart when recreating outdoors. So you'll be seeing, uh, I know we have a couple of her banners uh, hanging up at the Desert Refuge here in Nevada. So great, great work. Let's, let's definitely keep him busy on that. I, I oh yeah, that. <laughs> it's never a dull moment. <laughs> yep. um, so you talked about, you know, wanting to be true to uh, the birds in terms of color and, and your style. Do you consider yourself a birder? You know, it's so funny. For the longest time, I never really did. Um, you know, I, I always loved birds, but I, I guess I, I just never really considered myself to be an intense birder. And then um, when I was working out at Brooks Camp at Katmai National Park, you know, I'd be spending hours in a singular spot on patrol and... Uh, I would just start looking at the birds and I started to like train myself to hear their different calls. And I got really good at that idea. I was like, wow, this is really fun. <laughs> and then um, and when I started working for Fish and Wildlife, I was actually teaching uh, a program about 
uh, migratory birds. There's a calendar program that we do up in this region every year uh, where students are able, are able to draw bird art and enter it into this calendar contest. So I went to different villages in the area, about eight different ones um, on the Alaska Peninsula, teaching about birds and then teaching art. And I just fell in love with doing it. It was so fun, not just for me, but to bring the, ch the children out and the students out to see the different birds and get excited about the place that they live in um, and, and get to ID some of these birds that, you know, people would kill to see because they're in such a remote area. And then it just really started to click for me. And, you know, ever since I've just been <laughs> really into birds. <laughs> so yeah, I just kind of fell into it and I love it. I know what you mean. Prior to working for Fish and Wildlife, I was not much of a birder either. Um, I am definitely a bigger fan of, of reptiles and amphibians. Um, when working in, um, especially both like Redwood National Park previously and Great Smoky Mountains, there's a lot of salamanders. And so I spent a lot of my time looking for salamanders. But since coming out here and working in um, such a really great area for birding I, and having colleagues who are very into birding, it, it's a contagious hobby, certainly, you know you go from saying, hello, how's the weather, to hello, what birds have you seen, or what's flying around out there, and you know, oh, I saw a million flycatcher in, out in the orchard, and you know, like, run it up and grab in your binoculars, so it, it's definitely a great hobby, and I encourage anyone who's watching to, to take it up. Um, you mentioned going to different villages and teaching about art and birding. Um, Miguel in the, the chat would like to know if you teach any classes on illustration or drawing. Yeah, you know, I used to quite a bit, um, especially when I was living out in King Salmon, just because we didn't really have access to it otherwise. I did an artist naturalist class out there and did a whole variety of mediums for people. And it was great. Um, and, you know, the thought has kind of been tossed around in my head that, you know, maybe it's something I could start doing virtually since that's the world we live in these days with COVID. Um, but yeah, I, I used to do it quite a bit. And, uh, you know, I, I would love to do it again. Actually, this coming May, uh, since we're celebrating World Migratory Bird Day, for the whole month. Um, you could catch me doing some live drawing sessions about twice a week throughout the month of May too. That's fantastic. And then we'll have links hopefully later to where folks can find that and get more information about those live sessions. Um, do you have a favorite bird to draw or a favorite species to illustrate? Like, is there something that just, or maybe something that's challenged you to, to complete? Yeah, um, it's such a hard question because uh, every time I draw a bird, I it, it's it becomes my favorite in that moment, <laughs> you know. Uh, but it's something that's been really challenging, and then actually turned out to be kind of an epiphany for me is you know drawing birds that are just like you know what society deems as like unattractive, which I just don't think exists personally. But I was drawing a, a turkey vulture not too long ago, which is just like brown, you know. Uh, but as I was working on it, I realized that there's just multiple layers of brown and um, deep purples and magentas that are all blended into this bird. And I'm like, this is a very spectacular, beautiful bird, actually. Um, and I think that's what's so fun and interesting for me as a wildlife artist uh, is, is just seeing these like little tiny variants within these animals that are just absolutely gorgeous. Uh, another recent one that I did, I guess a couple months ago now, but I did um, a, a wild turkey, which again, so many people view as just being this kind of like brown boring bird and they don't realize the amount of extraordinary iridescence these birds have. Uh, it's probably one of the most colorful birds that I have drawn actually, um, just trying to capture that beautiful shiny iridescence. So I guess, I guess I couldn't say that I specifically have a favorite bird, but I really love to draw uh, the nuances of birds and really bring out the, the natural color and beauty that they have. Is there um, any particular artists that have inspired you or, or led you on this uh, journey, of, especially towards nature art? I mean, we, we, there's countless influences I know for, for portraiture and classic art and classic landscapes, but I, I think um, naturalist art is, is a much smaller collection of artists, and I didn't know if there are any either like uh, like contemporary artists or past artists that you have used as inspiration? Yeah, um, well, I could say as far as naturalist, naturalist art has gone, I, I love John Muir Laws. Uh, his work is amazing, and he was actually a big inspiration for me when I was just in the field and sketching. Uh, so, and I highly recommend if anyone wants to get into field sketching is to pick up some of his books because they're incredible. Uh, but, you know, I, I do have a, a really strong tie to a lot of classical art. So I, I really enjoy um, the Impressionist and Post-Impressionist movements um, just because, again, color. And that's 
that's kind of something that I, I really love. And that's what I really love to put into my work is, is the use of color. And with something like Impressionists, they are capturing a moment. Uh, so like a, a time of day uh, and how that looks like in a specific spot. And I find I found that to be really relevant when I was drawing these birds because I'm capturing usually like a moment in flight. I mean, birds just go all over the place all the time. So I'm just capturing this one moment of how the light is hitting this specific bird and how beautiful it actually is in that moment. So I, I think a lot of my um, sort of inclination towards highlighting um, different colors in birds really comes from, from the Impressionists. I think even in my video, I quote Claude Monet, who says, I would like to paint the way a bird sings. And I just think that really resonates with me. It's a very beautiful quote. Um, so Becca would like to know if you have a particular medium or favorite medium that you like to use. Sure. Um, you know, obviously I've been doing a lot of digital art, but uh, my I'm actually a trained classical artist. Uh, so I started doing a lot of charcoal, um, which is really fun. I'm a messy artist, you know, so I, like I get really dirty and my hands are all up and everything. I'm not like this fine technical artist, <laughs> although I can be pressured to do that. I don't love it. <laughs> but um, yeah, so I did a lot of charcoal and then I love oil painting too. And that was just a little bit difficult for me to do where I was living in, in King Salmon and in these remote or more remote areas uh, because you need so much stuff. <laughs> so I, I actually really started getting into just watercolor and pen and ink. Uh, so that in recent years I was doing a lot of that and now I've kind of um, transferred into more of the digital art realm uh, and a lot of people it's funny because there's a lot of contention about it you know like digital art is that is that considered to be real art um, and I will say one thing nothing ever compares to the feeling a paintbrush has on a canvas there's just something very unique and special about that. Uh, but with digital art, I find it to be a lot more accessible for people and it can be used in so many different ways and reach such an audience. And since m the work that I do is so conservation based, I, I kind of want the messages behind what I do to get out to a lot more people. I don't want it to just be this exclusive thing. And I also want um, to kind of break the traditional way that a lot of these um, birds and wildlife have been presented in the past, which are gorgeous. You know, I, I, I own many Sibleys and I love the artwork in there, but it's neat to see these from a non-conventional point of view to kind of get more people interested in this that may have not been otherwise. I completely agree. I would say that art, you know, is like one of the most democratic forms of expression there is. Uh, and being able to share that with as many voices in an accessible medium like a digital medium, you're going to reach the most number of people with that and be able to use your art to share, uh, you know, these, these amazing creatures with multiple people that, you know, like we're broadcasting from Alaska and Nevada right now and then the swath of in between. It, it, it's a huge, remarkable thing to be able to do that. So that's incredible. Um, I had a question from Yvette. She wants to know, um, do you catalog the birds that you draw? Like some people keep like a life list of I birds. I do. Yeah, I do. Gosh, I'm not even sure off the top of my head how many I've drawn because I've drawn so many. Yeah, but I, I, can, I can look that up and, and comment on this later and actually count it because I have oh. lost count. Uh, and then uh, Jenny was talking about, um, she mentioned, you mentioned field sketching, uh, which is a mix of field drawing and studio drawing um, and computer drawing. Um, let's see. Oh, what is the, she wants to know, what is the mix of like your field sketches, your studio drawing and your digital drawing? Like, do you make a sketch sure. in the field and then like go back and finish it later? Or how does that I, process work? Yeah. So I have, I have a variety of processes. Usually when I am in the field, I am drawing everything and painting everything right there. So I have like a little book with me. I have, um, a little tiny like watercolor set and then a couple of pens that I use. So I'll just sketch in the present. But I also, I, I, I have a camera, so I take, I usually take a picture of what I'm doing too, mm -hmm. again, because I love preserving that specific moment. Uh, so I will take that, and, and when I'm doing my digital art, I will literally take that photograph and take a palette specifically from it, so the actual colors of what we're seeing, and then I put that into whatever I'm drawing. So usually they're, they're separated. Um, everyone's, most of, sometimes I will actually, um, like sketch something out first and then scan it in and you know do my digital thing that way too. But a lot of times they're pretty separate because the mediums are pretty different. Yeah, thanks for that eyedropper tool. You know? <laughs> the eyedropper tool is a pretty incredible thing, especially when you really want to highlight uh, some of these really beautiful colors. 
Absolutely. Uh, Scott would ask, is asking if you could please paint the iconic mystery bird of Arctic Refuge, the gray-headed chickadee. Yes. <laughs> photograph one on the Canning River. Love Arctic Refuge. Oh, that's so cool. You've been up to the canning. <laughs> I'm, I'm supposed to go up to bird camp this year, and I'm very excited about it. But I, I would absolutely love to, to draw a gray-headed chickadee. I, I'm a fan. <laughs> Uh, and then Miguel wants to know, um, you know, he said he needs some Sarah Bird art stickers. I so. can hook Miguel up. <laughs> okay. we'll, get you, we'll get you your stickers, Miguel. Um, <laughs> I'm going to put a pause on the questions right now, just because I do want to talk a little bit more about both refuges. So I'm actually going to go back and reshare my screen here with you all. Um, and we're going to resume our presentation. So... We have two refuges here. We've got Arctic Wildlife Refuge and we've got the Desert Refuge. And at first glance, you might think these two refuges are pretty separate, you know, pretty different. Uh, but, you know, they actually have quite a bit more common than you'd think. Uh, but let's, let's meet them real quick. Uh, so first we have is the Arctic Refuge, and this is located up in Alaska. Now, the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge was established in 1960 to preserve uh, unique wildlife, wilderness, and recreation values. Um, it is the largest national wildlife refuge at over 19 million acres, and it includes a wide variety of species, such as uh, polar bears, grizzlies, black bears, moose, caribou, wolves, eagles, lynx, wolverines and martens, beavers, even migratory birds. It's, it's really um, a showcase of some of the most iconic wildlife that this country has to offer. Now contrast that with the Desert Refuge. Desert National Wildlife Refuge established in 1936 to protect the desert bighorn sheep and other desert wildlife. Uh, now, much like the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, we at the desert are the largest refuge outside of Alaska at 1.6 million acres. So not nearly as big as the 19 million acres that Arctic has, but still pretty large comparatively to the, to the lower 48. And here at Desert, we're home to a wide variety of species as well, of plant and animals, such as the desert bighorn sheep, mountain lion, golden eagles, desert tortoises, roadrunners, badgers, and of course, migratory birds. And if you caught that, I did mention migratory birds for both of them, because a lot of the species that you will see at Desert Refuge or at Arctic Refuge, even your local refuge, wherever you are watching from near you, you might find a lot of these same species at the Arctic Refuge, there's over 200 species of birds that can be seen there throughout the year. And here at Desert National Wildlife Refuge, there's over 300 species of birds that stop by throughout the year. In fact, many of these species can be found at both refuges. And I just wanna take a moment and kind of highlight a few of the species that you might see at the refuges. The first one is the white crowned sparrow. This bird appears each winter over much of North America. Uh, and it, you'll find it in your gardens and your favorite trails, but in parts of the West, they're around, you know, pretty much year round. These white and black birds uh, have pale beaks and crisp uh, gray breasts uh, to give them pretty a dashing look. And it makes them one of the easiest sparrows to identify in North America. So these birds, of course, are migratory, which means they will head up in the summer into the Arctic to nest and breed. And then during the cooler months, you will see them migrating farther south and they can stop at a lot of your local refuges, even your backyards. A waterfowl bird I'd like to mention is the northern shoveler, and it is probably one of the most distinctive birds that you will see due to its large spoon-shaped bill. Personally, I like the fact that this bird's uh, genus name is spatula because its bill actually looks kind of like a spatula. I think it's just such a fun thing. Uh, and basically, they're going to use these large spoon-like bills uh, to forage head down in the shallows and wetlands, uh, looking for uh, tiny crustacean seeds, things they can filter out of the water because their bills have a unique projection on them that helps them kind of catch that, almost like uh, baleen on a whale. Um, the males are pretty distinctive. They have the iridescent green uh, head. They've got this blocky color palette, uh, bright white chest, and uh, rusty sides. Now the females are a little more drab, but still pretty exciting because uh, they have a giant orange bill and mottled brown plumage. And so again, you'll see this bird during the summer up in the Arctic Refuge and then in the cooler months down south. Another bird I'd like to highlight is also the peregrine falcon. Uh, this bird was virtually eradicated uh, from North America by pesticide poison in the middle of the 20th century. And after significant recovery efforts, uh, peregrine falcons have made an incredible rebound 
and are now regularly seen uh, in many large cities and coastal areas, and of course, at your local wildlife refuge. We see these at the desert refuge not infrequently. Um, and fun fact about these birds is they are the fastest animal on the planet and can reach speeds of 200 miles an hour in a, in a dive, which is just incredible. And all of these birds, these are just, you know, a small fraction of what you might see at the various refuges. Um, and I just think that is a just really incredible thing. And, you know, again, it's just a limited short amount of what you might see, but thinking about the interconnectedness of the bird that I might see here is going to be up in the summer at Arctic or different parts or, you know, the world. And it puts into perspective the importance of these birds, the fact that what we do here affects what happens over there and vice versa. And, you know, that interconnectedness it just, it makes the world seem a lot smaller and a lot more uh, fragile, a lot more important that way. Um, let's see, were there any more questions? No. Grace, did you have any questions you'd like to ask Sarah? Yeah, we had one more question that I saw right now, and that is from Miguel again. And um, let me pull that up. He is asking, um, I believe he asked if you, being in Alaska, do you find any connections to New York? <laughs> Sometimes every once in a while I do, uh, which is, is kind of funny. Um, I'll, I'll like run into somebody that randomly knows the, the place that I've been in. Uh, but it, you know, what's really fun about it is that I would say one of the main reasons that really got me into conservation in the first place was uh, in, this, it was called the Alley Pond Environmental Center, uh, which is in Queens. Uh, and I used to go there as a kid and um, it was really funny, like many years later, I went back like after I'd been living in Alaska and I, I saw, I walked in and I saw a picture that had probably been there since I was a kid uh, of one of the bears at Katmai. <laughs> and I was just like, this is very odd. So that was a very interesting connection between the two of them. Like this place that had just inspired me so much as a, as a child was also a, a very connected to a place that I had spent so much time in as an adult. So that was kind of fun. Yeah, what a, what a coincidence. <laughs> um, and I see that maybe you have your hand raised, so um, you can now talk if you would like to, um, or otherwise you can, um, you know, also use the chat, whatever works for you. All right, and maybe in the meantime, I'll ask one of my questions. Um, and I guess this is for both of you. I'm just curious um, how you have been or plan to celebrate Earth Day. Well, one of my ways I've been celebrating Earth Day is that I've been drawing birds all day, <laughs> for one. <laughs> But, you know, what's really fun about this time of year in Alaska is the lights really starting to stay out later and later. So, I mean, I think I think it's closer to 11 that is actual sunset and and it's twilight now um, all night. So it's not like a true darkness. So it's really fun to kind of just like go out in the evening and hear the birds at this time of year. Um because they're they're kind of going on all throughout the night, which is really fun because it's still daylight out. Um, and there's they're all coming back and it's kind of a celebratory thing up here to have the birds come back because it's like, oh, the dark winter is finally over. <laughs> so um, we all kind of congregate at different spots that are popular bird watching places and and watch the you know the trumpeters and the sand hills and the you know mallards and Can Canada geese come in and it's been that's that's how I celebrate Earth Day anyway. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and Miguel has a really fun question. Uh, any thoughts of doing bird tattoos? <laughs> All the time. I get asked that quite a bit, actually. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I, I have I have done quite a few different, not even just bird tattoos, but just different animal tattoos in general. Um, you have people asking for them, and I... Uh, I'll draw it for them. <laughs> or the, a lot of, sometimes people will just take the work I've done previously and do that too, because they, they're good. The style I do, it works pretty well for tattoos. I had not That's awesome. <laughs> now I want one. <laughs> now you mentioned that. <laughs> All right, and we have another question. If this is awesome, keep them coming, everybody. Um, yes. Nivet asks, is there a bird on your wish list? There is one, yeah. Um, I drew it not so long ago, but I've never seen a, a roseate spoonbill in person, really? and I'm dying to see one. I'm such a northern person, uh, so I, I would really love to see one in person. I, I would be very happy. 
two years ago, there was one at the Ash Meadows National Wildlife Refuge, which is about an hour from where I am at Desert Refuge. Um, and it was only the fourth one ever recorded in Nevada. And we think it might have accidentally imprinted on a stork or a heron or something that was migrating through because it was sticking around that other bird for quite a while. And uh, it stayed at Ash Meadows in the Crystal Reservoir for easily a month or so before disappearing. So, um, you know, sometimes they show up in weird places. You might see one, you never know. <laughs> that would be very cool. <laughs> It'd be very lost if it came up here. <laughs> Windy, I'm quite cold too. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Well, I'm going to check if there's any more questions in here. Um, all right. And I think that's Lida. Correct me if I, or my apologies if I pronounced that wrong, but any ideas besides art for converting people into birders? Sure. Yeah, I, I have a few actually. And, you know, especially during this pandemic where we were all kind of just like stuck inside and we couldn't do all the things that we wanted to do. Um, I find birds to just be such a part of everyone's daily life. I mean, you can just look outside the window and you can see these birds. I mean, it, it was just like a really fun activity, especially for me, because, you know, I can't, you couldn't get out as much as you could. And I, I feel very lucky to be in a place like Alaska, but um, that it was, it's something that like, I think connected me to so many other places and I was always just like oh it's really cool that I'm seeing this particular bird just right outside my window I wonder how many other places this bird has gone to because although we are all stuck in one spot these birds are still traveling and going about their lives so you know just just the fact that they're so observable just from your like living room I think is is really fun because you know animals and wildlife and birds are so cool you know and just in general just to watch them and I think birds are a really good kind of stepping stone to to get into it because they're right outside in your backyard. Absolutely. I, 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 yeah, I was just going to say, I think you probably have some ideas too, Josh. Yeah, um, I, I two ideas for, for um, creating new birders, at least what's worked for me. Um, the first, I would say, is to, to share your interest in your hobby with friends and even people you just met out on the trail. You know, I think, um, you know, especially this is true for plants, people have kind of a plant blindness where they just ignore the things that are they deem as uninteresting. Folks go to parks and they want to see the bears and the moose and you know, the big megaphone and birds are small and they're often overlooked. So being able to share that interest and excitement with folks, but also to tell a story. Talk about where that bird has been, the things that it's seen, the places, the distance it's gone in a single day, and even just to, to share it, its, uh, its quirks and behaviors. Um, for example, I'd like to talk about the Faina Pepla and the Mockingbird. We see both of those at the Desert Refuge quite common, and they are constantly fighting and bickering and going back and forth. And so being able to discuss the competition for food sources and the migratory habits of those birds, um, you know, it, it adds that layer of depth that makes you appreciate them more and then, you know, I think, notice them more, and then that opens you to noticing other birds as well. Awesome. Yeah, those are all great ideas. Mm -hmm. um, we have one question in the Q&A, and that is, do you feel like staff at Arctic Refuge are optimistic about permanent protection for coastal plain? Yeah, you know, our, our duty here at, at Arctic Refuge, I'm with Fish and Wildlife Service, is to protect and make sure that no matter what happens, we are doing it in a way that conserves the, the wildlife in these spaces. Um, and, and that's why we do things like we have bird camp every year where we have a group of uh, biologists that go up and study these birds every single year. And they're out there for, you know, over a month and they're putting a lot of like 24 seven monitoring into it because you know the coastal plains are a huge space for bird habitat and bird breeding um so it's it is really important and we spend a lot of time and effort with really passionate people up there uh studying these birds consistently yeah thank you for that um let's see in our next question um have you come across birds with peculiar behavior and have you captured such? Yeah, yeah, I have, I have two. I have one that's kind of funny and one that's not so funny. But um, when I was working at Katmai at Brooks Camp, there's a very specific area where all the bears will congregate. And I'm talking like 40 brown bears <laughs> that are just hanging out in one very small spot. Uh, 
constantly just stuff in their face with salmon. And the Glaucus wing gulls don't care. They're just like in there right next to the bear. If there's any like salmon that's just kind of like coming off in their off their mouth, they're just like in there grabbing it. <laughs> they they're not scared of them <laughs> at all. So that that was pretty funny. Um and then when it's not so funny, but something that people should be aware of um is that in the past couple of years, um kind of really starting around like 2015, but there have it has happened previously. There were a lot of seabird die-offs in Alaska. Um, there were common myrrh die-offs and short-tailed shearwaters. And it was really odd because there was a lot of like uh, uh, people that were commercial fishing that were finding tons of birds that were just coming right up to them and uh, they were starving. And they, we had, you know, thousands and thousands of birds that we were like having to survey and, and see what was going on. It turns out they were starving. So, um, you know, Bird die-offs do happen, um, but they are starting to happen at an increasing rate. So it's something that we are taking note of. What about you, Josh? Um, I think, you know, I, I mentioned like the way the Fana Pepla and the Mockingbird kind of harass each other. But uh, last year in the fall, I observed a Cooper's hawk, a young like, yearling Cooper's hawk, trying to chase and catch a cottontail rabbit out at the refuge. Now, it's interesting because cooper hawks are usually, they predate on other, like, on songbirds, other birds. Uh, so it was rare to see it going after a rabbit. But this particular cooper's hawk couldn't quite seem to figure out what to do. It would kind of land on the rabbit and flap its wings on the ground and didn't quite seem to know how to use its talons to, to grab it. So then the uh, rabbit would get up, hop away, the bird would chase it and kind of fall on it again. And the same, it just kept repeating itself back and forth. And the rabbit looked more annoyed than afraid. Oh man. <laughs> um, yeah, those are all great ones to mention. Um, and, and Becca had a question, first a comment. She says, I wish I had your jobs and asks, what do you both like most about working for your refuges? You know what I, I think one of the best things I really like are, are the people that I work with. You know, people are just very passionate about what they do. And, you know, being in the federal service isn't a particular, particularly glamorous job. You know, we're very much like behind the scenes. We're here as public servants to conserve and protect and manage fish and wildlife. And people that wor I work with are just very, very into that. And they want to do this. And it's their entire lives. And they're not in it for the fame or the glory. They're in it because they truly care about these places um, and have devoted their lives to it. So I, I think that's that's probably one of the best things I, I enjoy about working for Fish and Wildlife. Obviously, it's great going out and seeing the fish and wildlife too. <laughs> but but that it is, it is really cool is to work with people that care. I, I will echo that sentiment that, um, you know, having folks you work with whose goal is conservation, is protectionism, is, um, you know, driven by a sense of duty more than a paycheck, uh, you know, that, you can't find that everywhere. And I, you see a lot of that, especially in public land management. Uh, but for me, there, there are two things that I really love most, and that is being around so many subject matter experts. Like, you wouldn't believe the number of fish biologists I've encountered since working with this position. And, you know, they are really pigeonholed and narrow on the fish that they study and know about or experts with. And I think that's amazing that they spent their whole career studying this one little minnow living in this one little pond in the middle of Nevada. Like, to me, that is just amazing dedication. And I am eternally grateful for that. But the other thing that I really love about my job is being able to take what I learned from all these subject matter experts and then share it with folks and, and share it back out, making it accessible and, and, you know, creating that spark of understanding and appreciation for folks. Because when people care about something, then they want to protect it. If they don't know about it, you know, it's, it's easy to lose it. Uh, and so when folks come out and they see this bird or this fish or snake or rabbit or whatever it is, you know, they're having the best day of their life. That is like an exciting moment they're never going to forget. And I can make that moment more special by sharing more information on that and putting it into context or telling a story. Um, you know, I guarantee I've just made a lifelong conservationist. Yeah, absolutely. I can relate to all of that. It's funny, you know, we all work for the environment, but we care so much about the people that we work with and work for. Um, it really does make, make it special. Um, and I have one more question here and we'll, we'll close out soon. Um, how many birds have you seen and what kinds? <laughs> that is a hefty list. 
<laughs> I I would have to like send you the sheet <laughs> that I have recorded of all my favorite birds. Um, but I've seen quite a lot, you know, I was, I was very lucky, you know, living in, in Bristol Bay, particularly because it is such a like major flyway out there um, to both like the Aleutians to further north. Um, so it, I, I have seen so many out there. I, it, it was great. Like this time of year is probably one of my favorite times because I would just be sitting out in the tundra and seeing thousands of like trumpeters and tundra swans just going over my head. It was just incredibly special. So it's a big list. <laughs> I'd have to <laughs> pull it up and bring it up for you and let you know, <laughs> but um, yeah. <laughs> I don't keep a list. Uh, it's one of those things I need to get better with. Um, I admit it, I'm still a novice intermediate birder. I still have problems with the brown birds, um, you know, trying to tell one sparrow from another. Uh, again, that's when I rely on my, my colleagues uh, who have more expertise and are willing to share that expertise with me. Um, but for me, you know, I think like, the fact that I can say I've seen golden eagle now since coming out to Nevada has been like a, a lifer moment for me. And I don't know if it's, it's going to be hard to top that. Absolutely. All right, and I think we have our last question for the night um, from Darian, who asks, any favorite estuaries? Oh, <laughs> any favorite estuaries? That is so hard. <laughs> Killed me. <laughs> um, well, like I said, I really do love the, like, Bristol Bay, Knack Knack, King Salmon area. Um, the <laughs> Bristol Bay watershed is just amazing. Uh, like the habitat alone is just, so I'm pretty partial to that. But um, even where I grew up on Long Island, there was some really awesome uh, bird watching and estuaries there too, um, over in like the Oyster Bay area. Wonderful, yeah. The, the estuaries are a really cool type of environment. Um, did you wanna answer that one as well, Josh? I don't have any favorite estuaries, I mean. <laughs> I grew up in Florida, it has plenty of them, but I just, uh, you know, didn't think much. I spent a lot more time out in like the, the springs and the rivers and such. Um, although I will say, um, if I had to pick one, I would say the mouth of the Klamath River in California. Um, that was my first real experience with like a large salmon run and seeing great white sharks out there and the number of sea lions um, and how closely the tribes uh, the Yurok work with, uh, you know, the, the conservation of the salmon and the, um, that, that habitat in that area. It, it just really put a lot into perspective for me. So if I had to say favorite estuary, mouth of the Klamath River in California. Awesome. Two wonderful places. Um, and before I close this out, is there any last uh, things that you would like to share with everybody? Uh, I would just say folks who are watching, um, you know, try and go out and find your local wildlife refuge. Say hi to a park ranger when you go out and pick up a pair of binoculars and, you know, see what you can see. Yeah, and I guess my final thought would be, um, you know, when you're seeing that bird outside your window, think about how many other people have seen that bird. You know, that's the one, they're, they're an animal that really connects all of us ro worldwide, especially when we are not able to be as connected in person. So that's kind of a fun thing to take away. Awesome. Well, on that note, we will go ahead and close it out uh, for the evening. And I'm going to echo everybody in the chat and say thank you so much um, for joining us on Earth Day. And for everybody listening, keep in mind that World Migratory Bird Day is right around the corner on May 8th. Um, and you can celebrate by finding an event, um, going out to practice your birding skills, or just simply getting out to soak in some bird songs and calls. Um, so I hope Everybody takes that opportunity. And again, thank you both for joining us. Thank you for having me.